Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, sampling and non-intrusive testing uh, for subsurface exploration. But uh, before we get into the uh, topic of discussion of today's uh, presentation, uh, we are going to look back to the question set of the previous uh, lesson. The first question that I asked was uh, what are the methods of intrusive subsurface investigation. Basically, in the uh, discussion of this particular course, we just talked about, uh, talked about two basic procedures. One is excavation of, uh, of a pit or a trench in the ground for exploration of shallow layers uh, underground. And the second thing that we discussed, the second group of procedures that we discussed are based on uh, drilling a circular hole in the ground and uh, conducting uh, some sampling exercise. We did not talk about sampling in the previous, uh, previous lesson. We are going to talk about the details of those procedures today. But basically, uh, we talked about two different procedures for subsurface investigation. One is excavation of trenches or uh, test pits and the other one is drilling. Uh, drilling and sampling. Now, the second question that I asked was why it is imperative to maintain an exhaustive field record during subsurface investigation and I asked you to explain with examples. Now, the major problem uh, that the designer faces is to get a clear picture of the layers that are there underground and for this, he or she needs to have an idea about what is the sequence of drilling, what kind of problems were encountered during drilling, uh, and so on and so forth. And some of these issues I already have discussed in the previous uh, lesson. Uh, and the, for example, we can talk about the coloration of a particular rock or soil sample. And these colors typically change as the rock or soil sample they get exposed to the uh, weather. Now, another thing that you could think about is in some cases, because of uh, exposure to weathering and because of the unloading, because of the, uh, because of the loss of confinement, after sampling, some of the some types of rock and soil samples, they are notorious in changing their strength and uh, structural characteristics. Uh, as an example, we can think about the uh, rock uh, uh, type called shale, claystone in a sense. These, so these rocks basically if, if, they are, if they are kept exposed to the nature, then they, uh, they actually ravel and the, the uh, cracks develop. Several, several sets of cracks uh, develop at a very close spacing within the mass of the rock and if they are not identified or tested within a short period of time after sampling, they actually disintegrate almost completely in some situations and uh, become like powder. So, these, in these situations, it is extremely important actually for the field investigator or the field uh, inspector to describe the strength and other behavioral characteristics of the sample so that the strength taken in the design of a facility that is going to be constructed on top of these uh, uh, layers or these uh, geologic units, they are not underestimated or overestimated. Okay, then the third question that was given uh, was to, was uh, for you to explain the significance of the following of a few uh, field descriptions. Uh, the, the, uh, say, say for example, the, the uh, description that was given was gravelly sand with silt, some clay. Now, as soon as that description is seen by a user of the drill log, then what he or she has in mind is that this particular this particular sample contains a very large proportion of gravel and sand uh, 
and it also has got some percentage of silt and some percentage of clay. Now, the, the qualifiers that are used here, uh, the qualifiers that are used here with this qualifier and some, these two qualifiers, we know what these qualifiers mean. In, uh, in, in, in the terminology uh, of uh, identification of, of uh, hand samples obtained during a drilling operation. Now, with as we have noted, with means that th uh, that particular component silt in this case has got uh, it, it, it has got a percentage of approximately 20 to 30 and some the type of uh, constituent that is qualified with qualifier sum that has got a, uh, a percentage i mean it 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 it, it, it is a it is it has got a percentage of about 12 to 20 within the total soil mass so this particular soil has got almost a majority of gravel and sand it com it is composed of majority uh, for the main part by gravels and sands, sa gravel size particles and sand size particles and it has got 20 to 30 percent uh, of silt and 12 to 20 percent of clay. So, this essentially is a deposit which has got a very wide range of uh, grain sizes uh, within its volume and this type of deposit, one such deposit we talked about in one of the previous lessons is till deposit, till deposit that is directly uh, deposited from ice, glacial ice. So, that is, is in a sense the second part of the third question and what I asked is a possible name, possible geologic name of uh, such a deposit and uh, this deposit could indeed be a till deposit. Okay, so, that takes care of the question set and now we move on to the subject matter of today's lesson. So, what we are going to try to do today is to describe a few common procedures for extracting soil samples and rock samples uh, during uh, what is, uh, what can, uh, what is uh, common during uh, subsurface explorations, exploration or drilling and sampling procedures that we discussed. Uh, to some extent in the previous two lessons and then we are going to list the relative advantages and limitations of these procedures and we are also going to be able to describe a few common procedures for non-intrusive methods for subsurface exploration and we should be able to also say, also describe the limitations and advantages of these procedures. So, that those are the objectives of this lesson and in the first part of this lesson we are going to talk about soil sampling and then we are going to move on to rock sampling and finally, we are going to get into uh, non-intrusive testing procedures. Now, soil samples are extracted basically more often than more, more, more usually they are extracted by inserting a sampling device into the soil or excavating out a volume of soil and we talked about some of these procedures of obtaining samples by excavating out uh, the excavating out a block in the previous lessons and also the depending on what procedure is used during the sampling, the sampling could be disturbed or it could be undisturbed. So, we are going to look at some of these procedures that give you uh, disturbed samples and some of the procedures used for obtaining undisturbed soil samples. Okay. First of all, we look at disturbed soil samples. Now, what you mean by disturbance that is the first question that comes into mind. Now, by disturbance what we mean is that the distribution of individual soil grains 
or the distribution of the void spaces, the pattern of distribution of the void space within a general volume of soil that gets changed during the uh, sampling procedure. So, that is disturbance and disturbance could be caused by the procedure of insertion of the sampler into the ground and it could also be caused because of the unloading that takes place during the drilling procedure itself. Uh, be, uh, or the lack of confi the, the confinement which vanishes as a result of the drilling procedure that itself is going to uh, cause an unloading and that will translate into disturbance. Then the third part of disturbance could be caused because of the circulation of the drilling slurry uh, that is done normally in some of the drilling procedures that we have already discussed. Then the second thing that you have to keep in mind is that most of the sampling procedures will cause disturbance uh, to the, will, will, uh, will introduce disturbance to the sample to some extent. Now what is the purpose of obtaining disturbed soil samples? The purpose of obtaining disturbed soil samples is for visual identification of the sample in the field as well as in the laboratory later on and we could also use the samples obtained in this procedure to reconstitute a sample in the laboratory for further testing. And examples of disturbed soil samples include auger sample or samples extracted using a thick wall sampler. We are going to look at uh, these procedures in the next little bit. Okay. Now, here on the left there is a picture that shows a disturbed soil sample obtained by inserting a thick walled sampler. In this case the sampler is a split spoon sampler. We are going to talk about split spoon sampler later on, the details of construction of this type of sampler later on. So, this one is a split spoon sample. What you have got here, uh, so thi this one here is the sampler, this one and this one and this one here is the soil sample and you can probably make if you if you if you can make out if you look carefully this particular sample is uh, is a is a sample containing uh, uh, it is a sand sample basically and it has got some gravel also in it you should notice the presence of drilling slurry near this particular portion of the sample. So, the nature, the, the, the nature, the disturbed nature of this particular sample is evident from the pattern that you see on the picture there. Okay, so, that is a split spoon sample it is a disturbed sample, it is taken by a split spoon sampler and it has got a lot of disturbance inserted because of the fact that this particular sample is obtained using a very thick walled, inserting a thick walled sample into the soil and secondly because of the intermixing of the soil with the drilling slurry. Okay, so, that is the details of a split spoon sample. And then the picture on your right shows an auger sample. So in this case, you you saw a picture of an auger in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, a few uh, in in one of the previous lessons. And here, what we got actually is an auger, which is being used for drilling 
So, this is our auger and this auger is bringing out the soil under from underground on the auger flights. So, th this this disturbed sample is called an auger sample. So, here the disturbance is even more in comparison with a split spoon sample in the sense that we do not exactly know from which depth the auger sample is actually coming exactly and they are totally altered in, in a, the, the interlayering, interlayering within the different portion that might be existing in underground surface, underground uh, structures, they are totally destroyed as the sample is brought to the ground surface by the screw action of these augers. So, these samples are also retained for very approximate identification, could be retained actually for very approximate identification of the samples and finding out their relative distribution of grain sizes and so on and so forth. In comparison, the thick wall samplers, the amount of disturbance introduced by thick wall sampler is relatively less in the sense that in many of the thick wall samplers, you could actually see the fine uh, interbedding that are that is present within the uh, within the soil layers. And those interbeddings are not uh, identifiable in case of auger sample. So, these are basically two of the ex uh, two examples of uh, disturbed samples of varying degree uh, introducing a varying degree of disturbance to the uh, to the sample. Okay. So, then we move on to the undisturbed soil samples. In this case, the distribution pattern of particles and void space is retained. Unlike disturbed soil samples, in undisturbed soil samples, we have to lock in the pattern of distribution of individual soil particles and void spaces within a certain volume, within the sampled volume. Now, obviously, undisturbed soil samples, extraction of undisturbed soil samples is a more expensive proposition in comparison with that used for, with those used for disturbed soil sampling. Now, ex these undisturbed soil samples are used for specialized laboratory tests and these tests are particular, are those that are particularly affected by sample disturbance. Examples of un undisturbed soil samples include block samples for cohesive soils and frozen samples of cohesionless soils. How to extract uh, frozen samples? Actually, in case in, in order to extract undisturbed samples of loose cohesionless soils, it is essential actually to it is almost essential to freeze a certain volume of soil underground and using the procedure of rock coring that we are going to discuss in the next little bit to obtain a core of the frozen soil. So, that is the procedure used for extraction of undisturbed uh, soil sample of cohesionless soils. Now, undisturbed soil samples also require very careful handling after the samples are extracted and brought to the ground surface until they are taken to the laboratory and they are set up on a test stand and tested. So, between sampling and testing, the sample handling has to be extremely, uh, has to be carried out in a very careful manner, so that disturbance is not uh, introduced into, into the sample during the transportation of the sampling, the sample. Now, in between, the disturbed and undisturbed soil samples, we also can talk about an intermediate stage and that is high quality soil sample. So, in this case, this disturbance introduced into the soil sample is relatively less 
is much less in fact in comparison with those import imported by procedures that we discussed for obtaining disturbed soil sample. Now these procedures are much more economical in comparison with the procedures that are, uh, that are followed for obtaining, for extracting uh, undisturbed soil samples. Typically they are much more economical in comparison with uh, the procedures for uh, obtaining undisturbed soil samples. And these soil samples are also extracted for laboratory tests provided that the test is targeted in obtaining a soil property that is not affected much by the sample disturbance introduced during the uh, sampling procedure. And also uh, these particular type of sampling they involve there are two different procedures that we discuss uh, that we uh, two different examples that we consider here for obtaining undisturbed soil samples and they are by using large diameter large diameter uh, samplers and thin walled samplers they also require careful handling and testing now why large diameter and thin walled samplers are used for obtaining high quality samples that become evident when I draw this particular sketch. Let us say we try to introduce a thick walled sampler, cylindrical thick walled sampler into the ground. We are going to look at the definition of a thick walled sampler in the next little bit. Now let us say we are introducing a thick walled sampler like that. Thick walled sampler. What is meant by thick walled sampler actually is that the proportion of the wall thickness, so this one is the wall thickness. is quite large in comparison with the sample diameter. So let us imagine that we are inserting a uh, thick wall sampler into the ground and the, the let us uh, for convenience let us imagine that the ground, uh, the, the soil underneath the ground surface is a varved deposit. I am just uh, giving, you an, giving you an example here. So if you recall, a varved deposit has got laminations of two different types of soils like that. And in this case, typically, one uh, it is alternate layering of clays and silts. So let's say the deposit is like that, and in this case, these are all the silt layers, and the ones in between are clay layers. So they are thin laminations really a few millimeter thick. So now when the sampler when the sampler is inserted you can see within the sample within the sample the laminations they are curved down like this. because of the friction that develops between the interface of the sampler and the soil inside it. So you are going to have the laminations bent like this and that is an indication of the sample disturbance. Now you can see that near the center of the sample, near the center of the sample, the sample is relatively undisturbed 
sample is relatively undisturbed. That is one thing you can see. And the other thing is, other thing that is important is that this amount of distortion of the laminations inside the samples taken within the, by, by the, uh, by the thick wall sampler, the laminate, the amount of distortion or the amount of bending that is greatly minimized if the wall thickness of the sampler becomes smaller and smaller. So that is the reason why if we could devise a sampler which is of relatively large diameter and the wall thickness is relatively small and if we can introduce some ways of reducing the friction inside the sampler then we are going to improve the sample quality by a great extent. So that is the reason why th uh, thin walled and large diameter samplers are used routinely to obtain high quality samples. Okay. Now as I mentioned also earlier that these samples also require careful handling until the, they are tested in the laboratory. Okay. So soil samplers we need to look at if uh, we need to look at typical soil samplers then. So these soil samplers are typically pushed in to the uh, pushed into the soil layer or they are hammered into the soil layer. Now as I indicated in the previous sketch that the disturbance introduced into the sample because of the insertion of the soil sample sampler is reduced by decreasing the wall thickness. It can also be decreased, the disturbance can also be decreased by sharpening the shoe and also by having an inner and outer clearance and a piston. So what is meant by that, let us look at it in a little bit more detail. So what we want to have is a sampler which has a small diam a small uh, wall thickness in comparison with the diameter of the sample that is taken in. So this is our this is a uh, this is the sampler that we are talking about and in this case you can realize that the wall thickness is a very very small proportion of the diameter of the sample then the end of the sampler is crimped in this case and what this crimping does is that when the soil enters into the sample so this is the soil sample, soil entering the sample, entering the sample, sampler. Soil entering the sampler. So what happens actually there is a gap, there is a very small minute gap in between the, the soil that is entering the sampler and the sampler wall and this gap actually minimizes the friction minimizes friction sample to soil friction and that itself minimizes sample disturbance so that is how disturbance is minimized by having a thin walled sampler and also by having a little bit of inner clearance. Then the second thing that is important is to have a piston, is to have a piston on top of the sampler, on, on, on top of the soil sample and this particular piston prevents the soil from outside soil from outside the cross section of the sampler to get in to the sample, uh, get, uh, get inside of the sampler uh, during the insertion process and that actually 
minimizes the disturbance more. So this is a piston that precludes, that actually prevents uh, the soil from outside of the sampler cross section to get within the sampler during the during the insertion process of the sampler and that in turn minimizes the uh, disturbance. So disturbance is minimized by this particular disturbance is minimized by having a piston as well. Okay, so what are the measures then? We have to have a thin wall sampler, we have to have a relatively large diameter in comparison, uh, relatively large uh, diameter in comparison with the wall thickness of the sampler. We need to have an inner clearance, a little bit a minute inner clearance so that the friction between the soil in inserting a uh, soil getting into the sampler and the sampler wall is minimized and uh, we want to have a piston inside the sampler uh, which actually prevents soils from outside the sample outside the cross sectional area outside the outer diameter of the sampler to get into the sampler and these all measures actually minimize the disturbance imparted into the soil sample now what is a thick wall sampler and what is a thin wall sampler now thick wall sampler are those samplers which has got an area ratio of greater than or equal to 10 percent whereas thin wall sampler has got an area ratio of less than 10 percent. Now what is an area ratio? Area ratio is the ratio uh, of the area underneath the wall of the sampler to the cross sectional area of the sample sam soil sample that has been taken within the sampler during the sampling process. So let me explain what I mean by that. Let us say, let us look at a cross section of a sampler. The sampler looks like this and this is the cross section of the tube, sampling tube. So in case there is no, so this is the uh, thickness of the sampler wall this is the wall thickness and then inside of it is the soil sample let us for simplicity consider that there is no inner clearance so let us assume that the diameter of the soil sample is D and let us assume that the wall thickness in this case is T. So the area which is shown uh, by uh, cross hatching that area is going to be phi times D plus T square divided by uh, d plus 2 t square divided by 4 minus pi d square divided by 4. So that is the area, that is the area of the uh, cross section of the tube itself and this we divide by the sample cross section and then what we get is the area ratio. So this is the definition of area ratio of a sampler. Now as we have seen that area ratio what we want actually in order to minimize sample disturbance we want to have an area ratio of less than or equal to 10 percent or less than 10 percent. Okay, so this particular uh, sketch actually shows two different samplers used for soil sampling and the one on the top is, the, is a picture of a thick walled sampler 
so this one is a thick walled sampler and the sampler in this case is a split spoon sampler which is the same sampler uh, which was shown in one of the pictures earlier. In this case what we have is a shoe, so this one here is the shoe and this one is the split spoon. This has actually this particular part has got two uh, different it, it, it is uh, it is it is composed of two different uh, two different segments so if we uh, take a section there then it is going to look like this so it is composed of two hemispherical segments this is the cross section that I am trying to draw and then you can see that the bottom end so this one enters the soil first this end enters the soil first and this is the top end so this is the top of the sampler and this is the bottom of the sampler to the right and what is there at the bottom end the shoe has got a threading and these two these two hemispherical halves of the split spoon they uh, actually screw on to the shoe and they are tightened and once the shoe the shoe is a single piece uh, construction and once the shoe goes on to the bottom end of the split spoon of the two hemispherical portions of the split spoon then the split spoon behaves in a uh, in a uh, in a uh, they they cannot uh, they cannot separate from each other then at the top end of the sampler also there is a threaded portion and this is the thread this one uh, you can see a threaded portion near the top end through which the split spoons are at attached to an adapter and this adapter itself has got another set of threads so these threads that I am talking about in this case these threads they screw on to the drilling uh, rods such as AW rods or uh, BW rods and also is of interest in this case that there is a ball you can see that there is a ball inside of the sampler uh, by the way this particular view is a cut view of the sampler so the top half of this picture shows the outer appearance of the sampler and the bottom half of the sampler actually gives you a cut section so you can see the ball there near the top and this ball allows the air and water to escape as the sampler is inserted into the ground. Uh, so that is basically the construction of a thick wall split spoon sampler and once this sampler is uh, taken out of the ground it is it, it is it comes out of the ground with the soil sample inside then the shoe and the top adapter is unscrewed and then the uh, two halves of the split spoon can be uh, disassembled and this disassembled configuration was shown in the picture that was shown before. Okay, so that is the construction of a thick walled split spoon sampler. This sampler we are going to look at again when we talk about a testing procedure called standard penetration test later on. And then the bottom uh, sketch shows a thin walled sampler and in this case the sampler is a, uh, is a non, it does not have a piston in it. So this particular sampler is called a Shelby tube. So what is there actually? like like in the top uh, top sketch there this particular picture also shows a partially cut view so the upper half of this picture actually is it shows the outer appearance of this sampler and the bottom part shows the uh, 
shows the cut view or the section of the sampler. So, here obviously, this is your wall thickness, wall thickness, whereas in the previous, in the thick walled sampler, you can see that that was the wall thickness. So, it is obvious that the wall thickness is quite small here. Actually, both these pictures, uh, both these sketches are drawn to the same scale approximately. So, you can see that relative to the diameter of the sample itself, the wall thickness is quite small in case of a thick wall Shelby tube sampler. And here, the, the adapter near the top is shown on the left just like before. And this is the, uh, this is the shoe that cuts into the soil as the sampler is inserted into the ground. So, in this case, the sampler is not hammered in, but it is simply pushed into the soil gently. So, the Shelby tube is a pushed in type of sampler, whereas uh, the split spoon thick wall sampler is typically hammered into the soil. So, that is the construction essentially of a thick walled and a thin walled sampler. Okay. So, now we get, we try to look at a little bit of piston sampling. So, in this case, what is shown here is the schematics of a piston sampling procedure and this is, this type of sampler is called a stationary piston sampler. So, the, the sketch on your left actually shows the piston sampler present, uh, placed at the bottom of the borehole. So, this one here is placed at the bottom of the borehole. Uh, so, this one is the bottom of the borehole, bottom of a pre drilled borehole. And then what happens? The piston is kept stationary. You can see that on the le on the sketch to the right, piston is kept stationary, and what is done is to insert the thin wall sampler into the into the soil underneath. So this is the thin wall sampler uh, that we are talking about. At the end of the stroke, this has gone into the ground, into the soil underneath, and the piston, which was originally at this particular location, at this it remains at the same elevation. So this is the location of the piston after the sampler has been inserted, and you can compare it with the original elevation of the piston. Both these sketches are constructed at the same uh, vertical elevation and they are they are showing they show the section of the sampler basically so that is how a piston sampler stationary piston sampler operates and because the piston is at the bottom of the borehole when the sampler enters the soil it actually prevents the soil from getting into the sampler uh, by the display when the sample when the sampler tries to displace the soil so that is the reason why piston samplers uh, are used in order to obtain uh, uh, soil samples with minimal disturbance okay now we get into rock sampling so here the samples are extracted by drilling through rock uh, layers, drilling through rock layers using a core drill. We have seen in the uh, previous uh, lessons and uh, examples of core drill bit. Now, disturbance in this case is minimized by insert introducing double or triple tube core drilling. Core samples are described and identified in the field. They are saved in core boxes uh, before taking to the laboratory for further testing. Now, we look at the core drilling procedures in the sketches shown here. Uh, 
So, one on the left actually is showing you a double tube core drilling. So, in this case what is happening the sampler, so this is the rock core insert getting into the getting into the uh, tube. So, this one is the core and this is the drill bit and you can see here that the drilling slurry, this is the slurry in and the yellow arrow there shows the slurry out. So, by introducing a an inner tube, we are not allowing the the, the slurry that is getting out, getting uh, flushed upward, this particular slurry to come in direct contact with the core that is taken within the uh, sampling tube. And because of the fact that there is no direct contact between the slurry and the sample that is getting into the tube, the sam sampling disturbance is going to be minimized, uh, it is hoped. Then you could also have a triple tube sampling and that is shown on the sketch to the right. Here you can see that this one is the this one is the first tube, then you have got the second tube and finally, you have got an inner tube which is also called the liner. So, here you have got a double protection, uh, double, double protection in between the core that is getting into the tube and the slurry that is being circulated and one of the uh, one of the drill bits that is used in core drilling an example of it is shown on the picture on the right of this particular uh, slide and in this case the drill bit is a diamond drill bit. So, these tips the tips here they are diamond tips you could also instead have a tungsten carbide tips uh, in relatively softer layers, softer rocks. Okay, this is an example of a core sample, core sample of a basalt. You can see that uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the discontinuities and joints, they are clearly visible on the sample itself. Uh, we, are going to we are going to talk about later how to describe the discontinuities and the joint sets within such core samples and this core sample is ready for transportation to the laboratory. Now, we get into non-intrusive methods, non-intrusive methods uh, involve no intrusion into the formation. So, this particular technique is useful if exploration has to be carried out underneath an existing structure or the site is underlain by a number of underground utilities or exploration requires to penetrate contaminated sites which should not come into contact of the devices that are going to be uh, otherwise uh, inserted into the formation because then those devices will have to be cleaned up properly uh, and that could be in some situations very expensive. So, these procedures include seismic velocity profiling resistivity sounding and ground penetrating radar profiling. We look at now the details of these things. So, seismic velocity profiling use uh, seismic body waves and the body waves are in a sense P waves or S waves. So, P waves are similar to the sound waves in a sense. In this case, the particle motion is in the same direction as the propagation direction. S waves on the other hand, the particle motion is in a plane uh, in a direction transverse to the direction of propagation. Now, seismic waves, both these bo body waves uh, during propagation, they follow Snell's law. Uh, that means, the sine of the incident angle divided by the sine of the uh, reflected angle, uh, refracted angle rather they are the ratio the the ratio is equal to the ratio of the velocity of the propagation of the waves in these two medium. So, that is actually indicated on the sketch to the right. So, here we have got 
and interlayer the top top uh, above the interlayer the velocity of propagation of seismic wave is v1 and at the bottom it is v2 so in that case sin i over sin r will be equal to v1 over v2 as uh, seen uh, as seen on the equation there now uh, this is the seismic velocity profiling is usually based on reflection of seismic waves and the reflection reflected wave in this case uh, in uh, for this is the re reflected wave is the one that is shown there and the wave below is the refracted wave this is uh, known to you from preliminary physics courses so basically we make use of reflection uh, pattern uh, reflection reflected waves and refracted waves how do we do that is going to be explained in the next little bit so here what we have got we have got a very heavy beam say so we have got a heavy beam and we hit this particular beam uh, uh, we hit this particular beam first say to the right and then we hit this beam from the left now because of the because of the disturbance caused by this particular thing uh, seismic waves they are going to start propagating and in this case we have got a layered structure so this beam is at the surface of the earth and what we do we place a series of detectors of seismic waves so these are the detectors this one this one and this one as well as this one so these detectors they pick up the signals as they reflect from the interlayer boundary and come back and also they refract and travel along the interlayer boundary and come back and because of that uh, we can get different arrival times so those from those arrival times the pattern of those arrival times we can construct the layered structure underneath the location which is being surveyed by seismic velocity profiling so here the waves that arrive in sequences are shown on the sketch on the plot to the right bottom right of this particular uh, slide so in this case this one is the direct arrival that means the waves that originate there and travel along the surface and arrive at a given detector this one here is refraction refracted wave so that go down and start traveling along the interface of uh, layer one and layer 2 and arrive at detectors then you have got reflected waves their arrival is showing as uh, a, a as shown in that particular plot so using these patterns actually you can construct the velocity structure you can find out what is the velocity of v1 what is the thickness of v1 so what is the thickness h1 and also you could get velocity of v2 and so on and so forth that in a sense is the uh, seismic velocity profiling then resistivity sounding it attempts to detect resistivity contra contrast of different layers uh, all different types of geologic mediums has got different uh, uh, resistivity values for instance clays uh, exhibit typically low resistivity whereas uh, granular soils coarse grain soils they have got larger resistivity values uh, then the governing equation in this case is shown there it's shown below so that is essentially rho is equal to 2 pi times d times e over i so rho is the resistivity in this case d is the detect d d is the distance between the electrodes that are used uh, in order to circulate the current and these electrodes are placed uh, at the ground surface okay e is the uh, e is the drop uh, e is the uh, voltage drop between the detectors and i is the current generated uh, at the 
detectors. So in this case typically what is done is on the ground surface you place two electrodes let's call them E1 and E2 and then you have got detectors so let's call that D1 and D2 so in here basically this is the D uh, this is the value of D in the equation and this is driven by a battery uh, actually by a voltage supplied across the electrodes and then you are going to measure the voltage drop and the current in between the detectors. So those things are used in the equation on the left there. Now depth of uh, detection in this case is approximately equal to the electrode spacing in this case. So basically the depth of sampling of different layers is going to be equal to D in this case. The GPR profiling which is this is also very similar to the uh, seismic velocity profiling but in this case typically uh, we make use of reflection only not refraction. So in this case what we have got we have got a source of radar waves S1 and then, then uh, we have got a detector uh, called R1. So this is the this is what we do basically we have got we use a source and we use a detector to find out what is the radar signature of the subsurface layers and in a sense and then we alter the location we take the source to a different location and we take the detector to a different location and by looking at the signature for different uh, detection signals uh, signals detected we construct the uh, substruct the uh, the profile of the subsurface layers and in this case what we have got we have got uh, an arrival from which arrives directly from source to receiver through air then we have got direct arrival but this is from soil through the surface of the soil and then we also have got reflected signal arrival in this case arrival of reflection and that is shown by that line there and by looking at the patterns these patterns we also uh, just like before we can find out what is the interlayer structure. Okay, here we make use of we make use of uh, we make use of uh, radar waves between 200 to 900 megahertz, and we use reflection signature as we have indicated. Uh, then the antennas are shielded to eliminate reflection from above ground objects, and typically the depth sampled is less than or equal to 10 meter. Uh, the resolution is not very great in this case, and it doesn't work well for many absorbing material absorbing soil types such as clays. Uh, to summarize this particular lesson what we learned here are different types of procedures for drilling and sampling. We looked at a few common procedures for uh, non-intrusive methods of subsurface exploration and then we looked at the list of relative advantages and limitations of these procedures. We end with a question set. Uh, the first question is what is a thin wall sampler? Then how sampling disturbance to soil and rock samples is minimized? What are the advantages and lim limitations of GPR profiling? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of seismic refraction profiling? Uh, try to uh, find out the answers to these questions at your leisure and we are going to be able, uh, when we meet again, we are going to talk about the answers. Thank you very much.